being the recipient of the Coke Lifetime Achievement Award, um, it's really an incredible recognition of a body of work. In fact, when I got the notice that I was the recipient, I said to my friends, either I'm really old or I've done something good. <laughs> um, and they said, well, some, so, some kind people said maybe both, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, but um, it really is, is, is a, I guess, a validation of um, the recognition of the work that we have done um, you know, within the field of endocrinology. What's really interesting is that the research that we have done over the years is really at the intersection of endocrinology, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. And early on in my career, people said, oh, that's a really interesting niche. <laughs> and, and so it really wasn't necessarily, at least originally, uh, viewed as being you know, mainstream endocrine research. Of course, now fast forward, you know, 25 years, and it's very clear that there's this, these overlapping circles of diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Um, and I think we always knew that they were related, and we always knew that um, cardiovascular disease was, you know, a major driver of um, both mortality and morbidity in diabetes. But now what our work, and the work of many others as well since then, have really began to show is how are the two connected? And you know, what is the connection between the metabolic abnormalities that um, characterize the diabetic state and the increased risk of cardiovascular di disease? So in a sense, it's kind of come full circle. Um, and for that reason, it's you know, personally very gratifying that that work has um, been recognized as something that the endocrine society would want to be proud of. I'll say one more thing. Um, I think the other piece of um, the award really stemmed from a commitment on my part over certainly the last 15 years to be very actively involved in mentoring the next generation of endocrine researchers. And I've had the chance to lead our FLIR program that you might be aware of, which has really you know, become a, a signature program for career development. The, the kind of the backstory in terms of, you know, how I actually got into the cardiovascular area was that as a trainee, so as an endocrine fellow, my, my research project um, was in glucose transport and it was in glucose transport in adipose tissue. And we were making tools that would allow us to to manipulate the expression levels of a particular glucose transporter called GLUT4. Initially in fat, which is what was my project, but the tools allowed us to manipulate it in other tissues as well. And it turned out that there was this suggestion from another, another lab that glucose transport really played a very important role in, in cardiac hypertrophy. So we, because we had the tools, I actually created an animal model that was defective in glucose transport in the heart and it turned out that it developed cardiac hypertrophy. And at the time, it got me thinking and looking, really now beginning to look to see well, what was known about glucose metabolism and cardiac hypertrophy. And there wasn't a whole lot known, but there were a small number of people who were you know, looking at um, cardiac metabolism. And the common thread was that there were elements of this model that mimicked some aspects of what happened to the heart in diabetes. So, so, that, so that was the first kind of kernel that maybe this, this could um, begin to inform um, cardiovascular pathology in the context of diabetes. So what then happened after that was I began to actually interact with those, that small group of people who the majority of whom were not in endocrine um, but were actually in cardiology and cardiovascular science to kind of share my work and insights. And, and for a while, you know, a lot of my, my kind of scientific interactions were with that group <laughs> Um, not excluding endocrine, because I, 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 I was always a part of endocrine, I was always coming to the meetings. Um, but that, that was where some of the initial interest occurred. And then in, in one sense, me coming in actually brought them to actually focus on diabetes and the heart as well. And so it really was beginning to bring these two groups together. And then that, that clearly has grown um, quite substantially um, over the course of many years. 
I would say a couple of things. Um, a lot of our early work were in animal models, um, where we were essentially describing what happened in the heart in particular, but also in blood vessels in the context of diabetes, with a focus on both glucose metabolism, um, insulin signaling, and, and mitochondrial function. And one of the challenges in human studies is that I can always, you know, in an animal model, when I'm finished, take the heart out and study it. You can't do that in people who are alive, right? But what has happened over the years is that there have been um, an increasing number of tools that have been made available that can actually be applied non-invasively in humans to study heart metabolism, like PET scanning, for example. And so there's a body of work that has actually you know, occurred in humans, which has in many ways confirmed the work that we began in animal models. The second part of this is that in certain unique um, circumstances, um, whether it's um, cardiac surgery for heart failure, um, heart transplantation, and including if you are the recipient of, of a, a healthy donor heart, um, the physicians do cardiac biopsies to check for rejection in the first six to 12 to 14 months after transplantation. And workers are now looking at groups of heart recipients who have developed diabetes and know that they have tissue and are testing many of the pathways that we originally described in our preclinical work. And I guess the gratifying thing is that they are seeing the same things that are now happening um, in humans. If you look at therapies that have been developed for um, diabetes, which now have cardiovascular benefit, the, 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 the field has kind of come at it in different ways. So specifically, um, the field actually was very disappointed about 12 to 14 years ago when there were some landmark studies that were done that um, the goal was to say, okay, if diabetes causes cardiovascular disease, then if we just treat people's blood sugar and make them as normal as possible. If you look at therapies that have been developed for um, diabetes, which now have cardiovascular benefit, the, 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 the field has kind of come at it in different ways. So specifically, um, the field actually was very disappointed about 12 to 14 years ago when there were some landmark studies that were done that um, the goal was to say, okay, if diabetes causes cardiovascular disease, then if we just treat people's blood sugar and make them as normal as possible with whatever we can do, we should reduce cardiovascular disease. So there's some big trials that were done, and guess what? It did not. And in fact, in some people, it actually increased mortality. Um, and so people said, oh my gosh, like what's the point in treating diabetes, right? If, if our best treatments at the time were not necessarily conferring any cardiovascular benefit. So the FDA said, okay, um, any new cardiovascular therapy in addition to show, I mean, any new diabetes therapy, sorry, in addition to showing efficacy in lowering blood glucose, you have to show it's not going to increase the risk of cardiovascular disease. And so these cardiovascular outcomes trials became an essential part of the approval process for any new diabetes drug. And, and, and then there, there are a number of new classes which, 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 which came out, um, DPP-4 inhibitors, SGLT2 inhibitors, GLP-1 receptor agonist, and in at least two of those classes with regards to the GLP-1 receptor agonist and the SGLT-2 inhibitors, there was a significant benefit in terms of cardiovascular outcomes um, in people with diabetes. It turns out that these drugs now have benefit in people without diabetes, right? And, and therefore, that got fits in. Okay, we, we now have something that can actually prevent cardiovascular disease in, in, in this group of people. So it's like an accident, right? So these are diabetes medicines, but they now had this new bar to prove efficacy, and they now jumped over the bar to say, oh my gosh, they reverse cardiovascular disease. So that's now spawned um, a significant amount of research in terms of trying to understand why these agents actually have the cardiovascular benefit. And many of the pathways that we had described and others that may contribute to cardiovascular disease are now being interrogated now in people who are now being treated with these agents that have proven therapeutic benefit. So it's kind of how two things have kind of come together 
in a way to, um, to overlap. I'd also say that you know, people are actually also doing, I would say, preclinical studies to test some of the other pathways that um, we, and, we and others have observed um, that might be implicated. Um, many of those have not yet gotten to the point where they are you know, approved for human use. The fact that these things almost by accident um, were shown to be beneficial, people then now had almost a playbook to go back and say, okay, could it be that? Could it be mitochondria? Could it be oxidative stress? Could it be, could it be me metabolism? And if that work hadn't been done before, then people wouldn't necessarily intuitively would know what to go check for in terms of trying to understand the mechanisms for the benefit. We're working on really a variety of things. Um, and our original work, as I said before, was in metabolism, mitochondria, and insulin signaling in the context of specifically heart failure in, in diabetes and, and um, in obesity. So some of our work has now led us into some very interesting areas. So let me, let me start with some of our work in, with, with mitochondria, which are these um, organelles inside cells, which classically are known to um, generate ATP, which is kind of the fuel for all life. Um, and we had observed that in the context of diabetes, there is clear evidence of impairment in mitochondria in terms of their ability to, to generate ATP and certain other fundamental aspects of, of their biology. So we began to model that um, in, in various, in various um, states. And what we've sort of seen is that when you stress the mitochondria, it creates what we call um, a stress response in the cell that then actually has led to the identification of stress hormones that the cell then secretes um, you know, in response to this um, mitochondrial stress. So we've had a number of recent studies that have began to um, elucidate how a stressed out mitochondria signals to, to any cell, and in fact, these are not even necessarily classical endocrine cells. For, for, for example, muscle can actually secrete certain stress hormones when it senses that the mitochondria are actually undergoing stress. And so that's, that has been um, you know, a very interesting and a very um, fruitful area of uh, recent research that we have been doing in our lab. And because mitochondria are everywhere, um, we can now begin to study their roles in, in other contexts. So we have some projects now looking at the relationship between mitochondria and thrombosis, that's blood clotting, because you know, an, a heart attack and stroke are known diabetic complications. But for you to get a heart attack or a stroke, you have to get a blood clot that blocks a vessel. And so we are looking at um, these small um, cell fragments called platelets and really demonstrating, in fact, that both mitochondria and metabolism can also affect how much they choose to want to clot when given the chance to do so. And similarly, um, there are certain pathways that we've also initially began to study in the cardiovascular system that we're now also begin to, be beginning to see can also um, play a very important role in fatty liver disease, which is another complication of um, type 2 diabetes and obesity. So, so in one sense, starting off in sort of heart and blood vessels and determining you know, basic and fundamental mechanisms has now really gotten us into some other cells and organs to clarify many of the changes which have been well described to occur in those organs as well in the context of diabetes. That's the hope. You know, I mean, as I'm sure you may be aware, um, many diseases have been cured in mice. I would say diabetes has been cured in mice probably 300 or 400 times, <laughs> you know, with, with different pathways um, because certain organisms are kind of straightforward. If you perturb one thing, you fix another thing, and it's easy. Humans are a little bit more complicated. <laughs> and therefore, you know, there's still a long road from a discovery in a cell line or in an, in an animal model to translation into humans. But the hope is that, yes, that some of this work will um, identify new pathways that ultimately um, will be amenable to 
new therapeutic um, approaches. I mean, I've been at UCLA only for two and a half years in my current role. I previously was at the University of Iowa and the University of Utah, where I think the bulk of the body of work you know, was done. So I think it's important to, 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 to put that, that on the record, that these institutions um, also played a very, a very important role um, in that. I know that this is, a, this is being archived for the Endocrine Society um, Salwin Library. So you know, I'm particularly proud of one paper that we published fairly early on that described um, a mechanism by which uh, the diabetic hearts essentially waste oxygen. So they, they use a lot of oxygen, too much oxygen relative to a non-diabetic heart. And that paper was published in one of the journals of the Endocrine Society, Endocrinology, and it turns out is one of my most highly cited papers. So, so very proud to have a paper that's been very highly cited, but also very proud that it was published in a journal of, 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 of our society. I was born in Jamaica, um, the year that Jamaica became independent from Britain. And um, my parents were elementary school teachers, and their parents were essentially subsistence farmers. So you could see that the generations were kind of you know, advancing in terms of um, education. So when we were young, we were told <laughs> that you can become one of three things if you choose, a doctor or a lawyer. <laughs> or an engineer, right? And if you talk to people who actually grew up in post-colonial anywhere, India, anywhere, they will tell the same thing, right? That's, that, that somehow, you know, these were professions that um, your parents looked up to, and, and um, seeing that now, um, there were at least opportunities for uh, education that they said, that's what you should aspire towards. So I think I kind of believed I was gonna be a doctor from I was a toddler, probably, because I can't ever imagine a time when I wanted to actually do anything else. But I want to make it clear that it wasn't because I felt like I was forced to be a doctor, right? It was just that that's what you heard that you should do. And the funny thing is, I'm one of five, and if I ask you to guess what they did, three are doctors and two are engineers. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Nobody did law, right? <laughs> um, you know, and, and so I guess it was... It was we were all drinking the Kool-Aid, I guess, uh, in, terms, in terms of our, our aspirations. Yeah, so when I was a medical student, um, the head of medicine and, um, was actually a diabetes expert. And he is a very formal person, and you know, he would come and do rounds with us as medical students. And we were scared to death of him because you know, he, he really would ask difficult questions and expect you to be, to be prepared. But the one thing that struck me, though, was that um, he really seemed very knowledgeable about metabolic pathways and, 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 and sort of looking at the complexity of metabolism as it related to disease. So in contrast to say, okay, you have pain in your belly and you have, you have appendicitis, take the appendix out, end of story, right? Um, it's just, it's just a, bit more, a bit more nuanced. And for me, that was actually quite intriguing. And you know, so I looked up to him, and, and I felt that he was, was really smart, and he was smart to know what he was telling us and what he was teaching us. And so that got me interested. On a personal note, you know, my grandmother in particular, but both of my grandparents later in life, but my grandmother um, had type 2 diabetes. I was aware of that um, because I would see her like, testing her urine for sugar, because that's kind of how you tested it back in, you know, back in the day. So, and, um, so there's this awareness that there was this problem, your grandmother had it, um, and you, know, you saw people having some complications from it. And so that was, that was the first sort of general attraction to this as a field. Because I was very curious about this, um, when I finished medical school, and I did a medical school in Jamaica at the University of the West Indies, um, a former external college of the University of London. So what the British did was that they formed these, these medical schools all over the colonies, um, essentially copied the curriculum of the University of London. And because retirement was mandatory in the UK at 65, the professors essentially then went, went to the colonies and continued teaching for like 10 more years. So they're a really nice gig, right? Um, and, and, and so, but you know, very, very clinical training. 
And so um, I think I was a good doctor. I knew how to take care of patients. But I was still a little, this, 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 like, this itch that you had to keep scratching, which was how did these things get into the, the textbook? And so I said, I really felt I needed to get more formal training in research. And that was what motivated me to um, apply for a Rhodes Scholarship, which I got, and then to go off to, the, to, to Oxford to do a, a PhD afterwards. And so my PhD mentor, um, and so this is now in the, um, in the, in the mid 80s, um, said, you know, there's this thing that's emerging called the metabolic syndrome, um, which is this clustering of diabetes and hypertension and abnormal cholesterol. And we don't really understand it, um, but we think there are things that are linked. And, and therefore, um, my PhD project was to start off with people with high blood pressure and actually look to see if we could detect any subtle metabolic abnormalities that could predict a risk to developing diabetes. So, so, so that was, so now how the, in, the interest was becoming more formalized in terms of you know, pursuing an interest in um, cardiometabolic research. Um, so I, I finished medical school, didn't do any, any post-medical school clinical training yet, got this PhD, but knew I was going to come back and do clinical training afterwards to do my residency. Um, and um, when I became a resident, and this was in Chicago at Northwestern, I was kind of coming on like to two things. One was endocrinology and metabolism and diabetes. And the other, the other one, believe it or not, was hematology, because there are all these pathways about how red cells worked and blood clots and this and that. Um, but during my internship year, I spent you know, a month on the bone marrow transplant unit. And back then, people died on the BMT unit. It was just really depressing. <laughs> and I said, you know, I, I don't think I can do this. Um, and, um, and so I said, I think I'm going to focus on diabetes and metabolism and, 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 and so forth. The chair of medicine at Northwestern, Lou Landsborough at the time, was also an endocrinologist. So when he heard of my interest, um, he, he strongly recommended that I actually go to Boston, where he came from, um, to train. And, and I was also intrigued by that, because at the t by, then, by, by that time, um, people were developing molecular tools that actually allowed them now to manipulate very specific metabolic pathways in animal models. So my PhD work was in human studies and physiology. And now there was this opportunity to get training in sort of basic um, molecular mechanisms that you could, actually, you could actually still model in an animal model and therefore then translate that back to the physiology. So, so that was really the attraction to go to, well, actually here in Boston, actually, we're, we're in Boston as we, as we interview this, um, to, 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 to do my endocrinology fellowship and work with um, mentors such as Barbara Kahn um, in sort of the molecular modeling of metabolism. Oh, immensely. So, um, first of all, there are like two meetings that we, we would go to. There's the Endocrine Society meeting. There's the American Diabetes Association meeting. And what really struck me about the Endocrine Society was it really had the feel of a big family. Everybody seemed to know everybody. Um, and, and they were also very inclusive in that they, they really wanted to get the input and opinions of as broad a base of the community as possible. And that, that was very attractive. And what then happened was that um, the Endocrine Society, even back then, was always looking for younger people to become involved in and engaged in, um, in committees within the Endocrine Society. I can't remember exactly when, although I'm sure that, that um, Elizabeth can, can tell you exactly when, when I was asked to um, join one of the committees, but I was asked to join a committee. I think it was, in fact, it was, it was the Minority Affairs Committee. <laughs> um, and I, was in, I was invited to join that committee. Um, and what that did was a couple of things. One, it, we got to meet other people who were focused on this area within the organization. Two, 
um, we also realized that, that a big focus of that group was trying to, trying to really increase the um, pipeline into the society and into the field of individuals who were historically underrepresented in, in medicine and, and research. Um, and you really got a sense that people are really thinking a lot about this, thinking creatively about this. And, and so what then happened was that, you know, people see that you're engaged and then after your term is finished in one committee, you get asked to be on another committee and another committee. And I don't know exactly how many committees I've served on over the years, but I think quite, quite a few um, of the committees. And then at some point, you know, you get nominated to be on the council at the time or the board and, and so forth, right? Um, and so, you know, that was um, one important part. Now, in this process, of course, a couple of things happen. So you actually get to know people in, in, in the context of community work, but you also get to know people in terms of what they do scientifically. So for example, come back to my interest in glucose transport. It turns out that one, I can't remember which committee, it must have been Mac, which is Minority Affairs. Um, he was at the University of Colorado and he studied another glucose transporter called GLUT1. And um, he had generated a model where you could actually increase the amount of GLUT1 on cells. And we were thinking it was another model where we could reduce. And we were just talking over lunch at, at, at a meeting. And we decided to share tools. And that, in fact, spawned a, a very productive collaboration um, in that area, um, which certainly was mutually beneficial, certainly opened up new, new avenues of research and investigation for our lab. And then, you know, just one example of a random conversation of lunch that, that, that ultimately, you know, ended up being, you know, very, a very real and, and robust collaboration. Um, I can think of a few other examples at meetings where interactions at meetings have really led, again, to um, either enhancing or slightly redirecting one's um, scientific, scientific direction. The power is in large part the relationship because, you know, you can meet at a meeting and you can have, you know, an hour or two of networking, but that's not enough. It's, it's, it's the follow-up. It's, it's the meeting again in between. It's the exchange of reagents and so forth. And, and, um, and so in one, in one sense, the meeting is an opportunity to begin to know others, interact with others who might be doing similar things. But it also enables you to continue those conversations beyond the meeting. I think it's important to underscore that, that, that if you think about it, and I'm sure you just look, look outside the hallway, people are just running around, going from session to session and so forth. And so there isn't as much time as you'd think, you know, in the course of a two and a half or three day meeting to do that. But it's, it's, it's the initial relationships that you're forming that then ultimately develop into very robust long-term collaborations. There are a few things in life which are inevitable, and one of those things is, is we all get older, whether it's daily or annually or in decades, depending on how you want to count it. Um, and one of the things that you know, I observed, as, even as my own career was developing, that there are kind of two kinds of people. There are people who are very focused on getting advanced in their career, and they make tremendous discoveries, and it's great. Um, but there are those who also, as they do that, recognize that they need to ensure that they are um, transmitting the tools and skills to the emerging generation so that they can continue to, to, to bring the field forward. And it became very clear to me as, and I've mentored a lot of people over the years um, at different levels, um, uh, if I count everybody, it's about a couple hundred people. Um, and it's always remarkable what they bring to the table in terms of ideas, perspectives, some of which might be a little bit out there, but you know, I've always, always said to if one of our jobs as mentors is actually to, to stop and listen to our mentees, 
because um, many of them are actually way brighter than we are if we just allow them to, 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 to shine. Um, and so I recognized early on that um, if one starts to think about legacy, then yes, you'll have a body of work and everybody's, oh yeah, you discovered X, Y, and Z. But more importantly, it's are there, are there, is there an army of people now who are carrying on the work and expanding it into, into directions that one in single individual could never do? Um, and therefore, that, that has been you know, a very strong internal motivator, which is, you, know, you go somewhere, you want to leave it better than, than, you, than you found it. But, but more importantly, you want to make sure that people who are there are equipped to carry on um, the, the, the mission and purpose. And as somebody you know, who historically, from a group of individuals who are historically underrepresented in, in medicine, um, that was also an important uh, area of awareness and ultimately focus um, to ensure that you know, as I was becoming successful, that um, I was recognized as becoming a role model to many people. And therefore, you know, what could I do to kind of create pathways for them to, um, to be successful. And so that was one of the, 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 um, the motivations for kind of stepping up to, to lead the FLIR program when the NIDDK actually sent out, hey, we want to give money away, competitively of course, um, for professional societies to give us proposals in terms of how could you create programs that could build a sustainable pipeline um, to increase and to enrich both not only your um, professional society but the field and to um, increase the um, opportunity for individuals who historically um, were not well represented in, in that group. And so that was really the motivation for um, leading the FLIR program and it's a program that I'm, I think you are, I'm proud of, you've probably heard bits of it, and as you've made, this, made, 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 made these videos, but this is, the society now is just incredibly proud of, and there is you know, very strong sort of evidence to, um, to back up its success in terms of individuals who have gone through that program and are now emerging as leaders within the field and also leaders within the endocrine society. Yes, it's, you know, each year we have a reunion um, of the FLIR program. Um, I think this, this year was probably the biggest one that we've had. And it, you know, it, was, it felt like a big family reunion. And um, so, the, so, so there's that. And you know, I think you, when you sit down and you look at, at people now who are in leadership, people who are serving as committees, committee chairs, um, people who, who are now on the board, who, who are the graduates of this program, the reality speaks for itself. There are a number of challenges to the field of endocrinology um, in terms of individuals choosing to go into endocrinology as a career, particularly clinically. Um, and there are many reasons for that. I think that there are reasons around um, the compensation that one gets as an endocrinologist relative to other specialties. There are issues around the exposure that medical students and I would say internal medicine and pediatric residents have to endocrinology because a lot of their um, training is, is hospital based and what you see in the hospital uh, is people with severe heart disease or people with cancer or people with, you know, in the ICUs with pneumonia and things like that. And, and, and so a lot of the endocrinology is really, we've done, we've done such a good job in understanding many endocrine disorders that we can treat most patients outside of the hospital very effectively. Um, unfortunately, many of our trainees don't spend enough time outside the hospital in their training. And, and I think if we were able to um, you know, increase their um, exposure to this, then that might actually increase their interest. And, and even though I'm not you know, directly involved, um, I completely endorse the the plans of the society to reach into medical school to, to, to begin to um, increase the interest. The other thing which I think is important, more, more for on the research side. So there are many elements of endocrinology 
which I think have revolutionized many other fields. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples. It was endocrinology that you know, um, identified receptors. That, um, it was endocrinology that elucidated what we call signal transduction. It was endocrinology that elucidated um, sort of the nuclear hormone signaling. Well, the receptors now and many of these pathways you know, are representing some of the very mechanisms that are revolutioni revolutionizing the treatment of cancer. Um, and sometimes you get the feeling that these other fields feel that they, that they discovered it and now they own it. Now, many of these fields are bigger than us, I mean, in terms of, of, the, of the number of people in those fields, right? And so, you know, we, we have done a lot of, I'm going to say, the fundamental work um, that has defined many fields. I'll give you one more example. The Nobel Prize for um, developing something called the radioimmunoassay was um, won by um, Rosalind Yalo, a member of the Endocrine Society, um, and she won the Nobel Prize. If, and for many, many years, um, radioimmunoassays were done by endocrinology divisions or endocrinology de departments because we had the expertise. Well, for whatever reason, these things now sit in clinical pathology labs. And we are therefore, you know, a step removed from, from the, um, the generation of that. And, uh, you know, in one sense, I think endocrinologists are by nature generous, right? We, we want to, to, to take the knowledge that we have developed, and we really want it to have its, its, its broadest impact. The downside of that, of course, is that it then kind of goes away into other fields, and over many decades, then sometimes the connection between endocrinology and that particular area may not necessarily you know, be so obvious. So what that therefore means for scientific trainees is that they, they, they can end out studying what's fundamentally endocrinology, but either on another label or in, a, in another field. And, and so that's a challenge to the field, particularly on the basic science side, and it's something that you know, the Endocrine Society continues to really focus on and grapple with um, to ensure that our relevance to those who are pursuing basic research um, remains high. I think there are ways, there are ways to do that. Um, at one of my flair mentees, for example, um, you could look at her and say, oh, she's an immunologist. True. But she is looking at immune mechanisms that relate to obesity and that relate to infertility and so forth, right? And so it's, it's, it's bringing back those other areas around a focus of endocrine disease, which I think is something that is, is very important for us to continue to pursue to ensure that, we, that you know, really all of the discoveries that we continue to make you know, remain very relevant. Right. I would, my advice to them would be this, that because um, endocrinology spans multiple organ systems, um, in addition to the kind of classical you know, endocrine glands, um, the heart is an endocrine organ. It secretes a number of hormones. The skin is an endocrine, is an endocrine gland. The gut is a huge endocrine gland. Um, and so, because of the integrative nature of um, endocrinology, that individuals who are trained in, in endocrinology actually have a level of training that is broad, that actually gives them the opportunity, if they, if they choose, to actually um, influence other areas. And, um, and we see this in some places where, um, say, at health systems levels, that endocrinologists really are at the table driving policy in terms of how do we, you know, cost effectively institute treatment programs for diabetes or obesity, which are just very prevalent. And so you're talking about you now treating populations, treating thousands of people that there wouldn't necessarily be enough of us as endocrinologists to do, but we could certainly influence the way that that is done, say, in primary care, et cetera. So there's, there are opportunities like that. There are a lot of opportunities um, 
in terms of um, interacting with, collaborating with, informing other areas to actually improve the health of individuals. And then, of course, there is just the, there's clearly, you know, just the, the interest and the diversity um, of endocrine disorders that you would see if that, is, if that remains your um, primary focus. So my advice would be it's an incredibly interesting, incredibly exciting um, area that really touches on multiple systems and um, really informs sort of holistic care um, because many of the, the disorders that we treat ultimately, whether it's their complications or um, their um, pathophysiology, really touches many, many other systems. So that's, that, that would be my sell to our trainees who are, who are considering um, you know, going into that area. Um, I'd also say that um, because we are in a world where A, the population is aging relative in terms of the, 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 the distribution of age across the entire population, B, the um, prevalence of metabolic disorders is rising, that the need for people with endocrine expertise is only going to increase.